And as a quick reminder, if you have your cell phone with you today, which I'm sure 99.9% .9 of you do, we would ask that you put it on silent. And with that, the meeting is called to order. We will start the meeting this morning with a chaplain prayer. Good morning, everyone, to the Honorable Mayor Brenda Gunter, the esteemed members of the San Angelo City Council and all officers and department heads. We, I greet you with love in Jesus' name. Will you pray with me? Precious Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, we come before your holy presence seeking your counsel and favor over today's city council meeting. We ask that you please have mercy and incline thine ear and hear our prayer. We honor, worship, and praise your holy name. It is written in 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Holy Father, forgive us of any and all sin that may be in our lives, and let nothing hinder our prayer from being acceptable to you. I ask you to let the business that's about to be conducted today be done in a way that will glorify you and be edifying to all. We ask for your blessings over our Mayor, Brenda Gunter, the San Angelo City Council, and every department head. Again, it is written, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So thank you, Holy Father, for hearing us, and we pray that your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Let your blessings rest upon everyone in attendance today. In the matchless, holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Gary, I want to thank you for that. It was beautiful. And that was done by Gary Jenkins, who is our police chaplain. So thank you very much. We will now do our pledges, and today we are lucky to have Addie and Cooper Carson. Addie is a third grader at Bonham Elementary, and Cooper is a kindergarten at Bonham Elementary. So they're going to lead us in our pledges today. Okay, we'll start here. Our first proclamation this morning will be um, San, about San Angelo School Choice Week. All children in San Angelo should have access to the highest quality education possible. San Angelo recognizes the important role that an effective education plays in preparing all students in San Angelo to be successful adults. Quality education is critically important to the economic vitality of San Angelo. San Angelo is home to a multitude of excellent education options from which parents can choose for their children. Educational variety not only helps to diversify our economy, but also enhances the vibrancy of our community. Our area has many high quality teaching professionals who are committed to educating our children. School Choice Week is celebrated across the country by millions of students, parents, educators, schools, and organizations to raise awareness of the need for effective educational options. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, Texas, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim January 20th through the 26th, 
2019 as San Angelo School Choice Week in San Angelo, Texas, and call this observance to the attention of all of our citizens. Do we have members in the audience f uh, representing uh, school, San Angelo School Choice Week? Okay. Our next proclamation will be recognition of Economic Development Business Retention and Expansion Coordinator Sharon Scott's selection as one of the recent 20 under 40 honorees. Shannon, are you here today? Guy, you're here? Perfect. We congratulate Shannon Scott on her inclusion in this year's class of 20 under 40 honorees. This program recognizes and applauds <laughs> rising young leaders in our community. Shannon certainly fits that bill. As an economic development specialist in the city's economic development department, she plays a key role in growing jobs and expanding San Angelo's economic base. Among her duties, she assists in the work of the city's development corporation, she manages the Tax Increment Reinvestment Zone Program, and she works with the Business Retention and Expansion Program. As a result, she has assisted in the revitalization of our historic downtown, helping to transform boarded-up buildings into thriving new enterprises. Despite her accomplishments to date, Shannon is still striving to better herself professionally. She is currently enrolled and excelling in Texas Tech University's MBA program for working professionals. We're eager to see where her career takes her and the impact she will have on our community. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby recognize and applaud Shannon Scott for her achievement and positive determination to make a difference in our community and our municipal government. I just want to say that I'm very honored uh, to be selected as one of the 20 under 40 for 2018. Um, it really means a lot to me that the mayor, uh, city council, and city staff have also recognized that achievement. So thank you very much. I'd just like to add that the uh, proclamation is a bit prophetic because uh, since the time uh, that this proclamation was made, we have promoted Shannon to the uh, business retention expansion coordinator within the uh, City of San Angelo Development Corporation. We're very proud of what she's uh, doing and has already done uh, for our organization. So thank you, Shannon. We, Bertha Garcia, are you in the audience today? Come on up here. The city of San Angelo is losing a public servant of boundless heart, humility, and dedication. On January 31st, Bertha Garcia retires as office assistant for the Recreation Department. She will do so with 24 years of service to the city of San Angelo. Bertha began, began her career in the city of San Angelo's health department, serving there for almost 10 years. After moving to the vehicle maintenance department for a few years, an opening at the Recreation Department became available. For more than 13 years, Bertha has become the face of San Angelo Recreation. When customers walk in the doors, Bertha is the face they expect to see to greet them. On days when Bertha is not at her desk, everyone always asks about her. She is gifted with the ability to make the customer feel special. She knows many by name and is also familiar with the families who have been a part of the Recreation Department's program for years. Of her city career, Bertha says that when the position came available in recreation, she felt that she would work there for the rest of her career. It was a perfect fit for me. I have really enjoyed working with my recreation family. I have spent more time with them than my own. Therefore, I, Brenda Gunter, Mayor of the City of San Angelo, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby recognize and applaud 
Bertha Garcia for her achievement and positive determination to make a difference in our community. I'd like to thank um, the San Angelo City family for the blessed years that I had. Thank you so much. We will now open up the meeting for public comment. Issues or items that are not on the regular agenda may be raised by the public at this time. Citizens should speak from the podium, begin by stating their name, and limit remarks to less than three minutes. Council members may request that a discussed item be placed on a future agenda. This council takes public comment on all regular agenda items during the discussion of those items. Do we have anyone in the audience today who would like to make some public comments? With no one coming forward during the public comment section, we will move into the consent agenda. I'm going to start with Billy. Do you have something you would like to pull from consent? No, ma'am. Lane? No, ma'am. Tom? No, ma'am. Harry? No. With no items being pulled from the consent agenda, we will ask for a motion to approve all consent agenda items. So moved, Mayor. Second. With a motion and a second, do we have any public comment on any of the consent agenda items? With none, we'll take a vote. All in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 With none opposed, the motion passes 5-0. We will now move into our regular agenda. Item A is consider ratifying amendment number one in the amount of 34,511 and approving amendment number two in the amount of 26,756 to task order five, originally issued to Fries and Nichols in the amount of 111,827 for the design of a stormwater detention basin for Avenue P drainage improvements and authorizing the city manager to execute all related documents. Russell, you're on. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, good morning Russell. All right, just to remind everyone uh, about the Avenue P project, uh, just to go a little into a little bit of background. Uh, this project was identified in our 2000, or the year 2000 master drainage plan as the number two uh, most important project uh, that the city had. Um, and, since then, we've done several iterations of uh, solu solutions for that uh, project. You know, we've looked at several different things, and this is the one that has really come to the most fruition. We've, you know, we're moving forward with design. Um, we ran into a couple of snags, and that's why we're here today. Um, but anyway, just to give you kind of an idea of the drainage area that's uh, coming to Avenue P. Avenue P is over here on the east side of the project. Um, there's about 460 acres here. This uh, entire outlined area is draining to Avenue P. Um, and on the far west end is uh, ASU campus. And then here, on just west of Avenue P, is US Highway 87. And from Avenue P, sorry, from here to the far end is approximately two miles. It's just a very large area. All right, so we approached Fries and Nichols to help us with this preliminary, or with the original design. Uh, we asked them to look at a couple of alternatives for us, you know, what it would cost to uh, construct an earthen berm uh, detention pond versus using uh, concrete retaining walls. Uh, they were going to look at uh, stormwater mo modeling to 
size the outlet structure so that it wouldn't overflow the street and uh, to help minimize the flooding on Avenue P and then overall construction costs for the project. Uh, so during our design work or during their design work, uh, they were doing a geotechnical investigation and this is what brought on uh, addendum number one. Uh, they found uh, while they were drilling, there was uh, many noxious fumes or basically gas smells coming out from underneath the surface. Uh, and what that required was an environmental site assessment. Um, per TCEQ requirements, whenever you run into something like that, you had to report it to TCEQ. And uh, this environmental site assessment is to, you know, do a little more in-depth research as to what's underneath the surface there and why those noxious fumes are there and then any kind of re remediation that the city would need to do to, to remove uh, and, you know, any hazardous material underneath the surface while we're doing this work. Um, and then addendum two uh, was looking at uh, adjusting the water and sewer mains and replacing the downstream, or the downstream asphalt and pavement where the, you know, where the detention pond will be and, uh, discharging to. And, uh, you know, during our preliminary uh, work with uh, Friesen Nichols before we even started the scope, you know, we looked at those elevations. We didn't think that they were going to be an issue. But once they got a more detailed set of plans put together and some more site investigations, um, you know, potholing and then things of that nature, we found that those were going to be in conflict. So instead of just doing a point repair at those instances, we're looking at doing a little bit more extensive uh, water and sewer replacement in just in that immediate area. Um, and then two, you know, with the condition of the existing asphalt pavement where this outfall structure will, will be, you know, we felt like it was, you know, made more sense to go ahead and replace that pavement as well, put some concrete in there so that it'll have much more lo uh, longer lifespan. So the combination of these two um, amendments was greater than the 25% of the original contract, and that's why we needed to bring it to council today to get your... Um, approval on moving forward with with those so just to give you kind of an update addendum one we, we ran into that a little bit earlier into uh, the design work and or the, the initial design uh, we have that partially completed and based on their initial findings it doesn't look like we're gonna have to do very much remediation on that because the contamination levels that were found were pretty low so that's promising, but we haven't gotten that final report yet, so we're still working on that exactly. Um, and then two, one, should we get approval today for, for this? Uh, you know, Friesa Nichols has given us kind of a timeline as to how long it can, it's gonna take them to make the adjustments on this, and it's gonna be about eight weeks to, to do all of that rerouting of water and sewer mains and coming up with those costs. So, how are we going to pay for this? So um, amendment one, we're going to be using the Avenue P funds that we have allocated to Avenue P. Amendment two, we're going to be breaking that up into, uh, you know, using the water and sewer and street bond funds to pay for that so that way we're not taking away from Avenue P uh, dollars. With that, uh, staff recommends approval of amendment one and two. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those now. Well, I'm going to make one comment, and then I'm going to let Harry make some comments because he lives with this on a daily basis. Right. But obviously, um, the folks who have suffered through all the flooding for, what is it, 50 years? Yeah. Um, right. I think that these dollar amounts are reasonable dollar amounts, and I truly believe that the Avenue P project needs to happen. And so I appreciate the information. I wish it wasn't going to take eight weeks. But I think this needs to get done. Harry? Of course. Uh, you, and you're right, Mayor. Uh, I deal with it almost daily. Uh, and any time we get rains like we had in September and October, uh, I'm down there uh, visiting with the residents, uh, watching the water. So I appreciate the fact is we are, are finally getting to the spot where we're going to get this completed. Uh, been working with this for more than 30 months. And so the residents, uh, I'm sure that they're, they're looking to see that first uh, shovel of dirt turn so that they know that uh, we're finally getting to the spot where they're going to have a fix on, on this. So uh, as the mayor said, uh, if we can move this along, eight weeks sounds like a lot, 
30 months is a long time. 50 years is way long, too much long. Let's get this done. <laughs> and they're usually pretty conservative with their time estimates, so um, you know, maybe we'll get done a little quicker than that. Move to approve as presented. Billy, did you have a question or comment before we do that? Yes. If you would, go ahead. And All then right. We'll um, Russell, I'm just trying to make sure I understand this. What role did Freeze Nichols play in the beginning of this project when we awarded it to them? Um, what was so their role? Their, their role was the, basically the design engineer on the project. Um, you know, they actually had helped us with the our, our master plan that we developed back in 2000, um, and they've helped us with some other, you know, design alternatives. And so, you know, once we found that this was going to make the most sense, you know, we decided to move forward with uh, using them as the consultant on the project. Well, I certainly agree because I think whether you sat on the council or not, you certainly understood the problems that those residents were encountering that lived in that area. But I guess my basic question is, if Freeze Nichols was the engineering group that did this, how did they miss doing a site assessment and then when you look at the contract, in the basic um, services. services, thank you, um, it looks like they didn't include um, a site assessment. And any time you build, seem like, the, you know, on an undeveloped property, seem like that would be a basic that you would do a site assessment. And then on the other thing, the other amendment, it looked like there was an oversight on the engineering group's part on what we needed to do with the water and sewer lines. So my question is, why does the city have to fund these additional expenses? Why wouldn't that come under Freeze Nichols since they were the ones, you know, who made the assessment, who did everything? Why, why don't they cover those expenses? Well, you know, we do have a limited budget. So, you know, that was one thing that was in consideration as we were, you know, looking at saving costs where we could, um, you know, the environmental side assessment, um, you know, that sometimes is done with when you, whenever you purchase the property, um, you know, that, you know, I'd have to defer to them. I don't know why we didn't include the environmental side assessment in there, mainly because we didn't, you know, it was vacant land. We didn't think that it was going to be an issue. Um, as far as the water and sewer, we did have those discussions early on, you know, that, um, you know, we didn't think that it was going to be in conflict, you know, so where it's in conflict is at the outlet structure and the foundation that's required for that. Um, and so once they had a more detailed um, set of plans and, and elevations that they knew that they needed to meet, um, you know, we did some potholing and things of that nature, and we found that, you know, we are going to have to do some um, adjustments to the water and sewer main. So, um, so that's why we had to come back and put that into the scope of services. Well, I certainly would not vote against this, not at all, because I'm sure there would be an uprising right here. But um, I just think, you know, for future references, sure. it seemed like that would be, you know, one of the things. If we're looking at going into undeveloped properties, we would, you know, certainly be mindful of, of that. So yes, I just hate to see the city have more expense on something that our engineering firm didn't take into account. Thank you, Mayor. Thank Lane you, Russell. You, Lane, you seconded Harry's motion. Do you now have a question? I have a, just a quick question. And if necessary, how much time would the remediation add, or would that be kind of simultaneous? In well, what we're finding is now, I mean, we've already moved forward with the environmental site assessment, and uh, we've done the tests that we needed to do to figure out what type of remediation we're, we were going to have to do. And what I was saying before is we, it doesn't look like we're going to have to do any remediation at this point. All right, there was a motion and there was a second. Um, is there any public comment? Good morning, Council. Steve Hampton. Um, <clears throat> a very good question, uh, Councilman DeWitt. Uh, my question is, uh, what is it that we're soft-stepping around? It seems like we're not going to reveal what the pollution was. Uh, I'm just curious uh, what it was. Thank you. Russell, you want to answer that? Well, I still haven't gotten the final report back, but based on what I understand is it was uh, hydrocarbons or gas-type smell is what, what it was, and it was just a 
at a concentrated level. So, um, you know, whatever, that's all that I can really add to that. Does somebody else have an answer for that question? Uh, uh, TCEQ is the one demanding we do this. Is that correct. correct? So, I mean, that's anytime you run across something like this, you need to report it to the TCEQ. Um, but it, 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 hydrocarbon or gas, you know, somebody could have spilled a five gallon can, you know, 50 years ago and it, you know, seeped into the ground. And now it's, you know, now that we dug up um, doing the geotechnical investigation, um, you know, that was what brought the, the smell up. So it just, that's what triggered the hole it. in the wrong place. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> it was only in two of the holes out of the 20 that we dug. So, Mayor. You barely I'm please. sorry, Lane generated another question for me. If we don't know, um, you know, what the spill was or, or what caused the concern, how do we know how to remediate it? There are well, different what, ways to remediate different things. Right, and so that's what this environmental assessment did is we went back and, uh, you know, really just looked at the scope or, you know, how much area was contaminated. So they did dug more holes, uh, you know, really figured out, you know, what the exact um, area that was affected and and then took samples out of there and then you know went took those back to the lab and based on you know the contamination rate or the concentration rate that that's what dictates the amount of remediation that we have to do and so th those contamination rates were much lower than the regulated limits and so um, that's why we didn't have to do any type of remediation or that's the preliminary report that I'm getting that answer your question. So we're we're pretty certain that we're certain these that we don't have to do anything. Or we'll cover everything that needs to be. We won't have to come back That's for correct. another amendment. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Any other comments or questions from council? All right. We've had a motion, a second. Um, any further public comment? With no further public comment, we will take a vote. All in favor of approving item A, say yes. Aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? With none opposed, motion passes 5-0. Item B, consider approving a professional service agreement under RFQ ES-01-19 to Centurion Planning and Design <coughs> LLC in the amount of two million one hundred sixty thousand four hundred ninety seven for design and construction phase services for the Chadburn Street Improvement CIP project and authorizing the city manager to execute all related documents. Andy, oh no, it would be Rick. <laughs> Mayor, oh, Rick, Rick and Andy. Yeah, there you go. Mayor, there you go. yes. I need to recuse myself from this item. I have a business relationship with, with this firm, so. Harry? She does that. Do, do we have enough to vote? Okay. Hey, today I'm bringing a uh, item to you that is. Let me make this thing go forward. Uh, before you, it's a follow-up item that council reviewed uh, a while back, and this is kind of an exciting project talking about the Chadburn Street improvements. And just kind of a recap uh, to refresh everybody's memory, the project uh, as envisioned had three phases, uh, one from uh, the Concho River to Borgard, which is phase A, phase B being Borgard onto 6th Street or Houston Heart, and then phase C being from the river going south uh, toward Washington. Um, if you recall, it was basically a, a multiple task uh, project which included uh, the street at Stealth, which was replacement of that with concrete uh, and the, the curb and gutter, but also the streetscape elements. So you're, you're replacing uh, all of the, the sidewalks and the streetscape that would go with that. Um, it also included uh, a, a connection for, from Chadburn Street down to the River Trail, and it included uh, our utility improvements, which are water, sewer, all those kind of things that, that go along with the project. So a very large um, project in comparison to a lot of the ones we take on. Um, as you recall, we submitted a application to TxDOT as part of the transportation set-aside program. We're trying to get uh, grant dollars to leverage to uh, help us out in finding the funding for this project. 
Um, if you recall, we, we did that application at the time. We uh, chose to do a 25% match on the application to increase our chances. And we were successful in getting a $1.96 million grant for phase A for the, the project. Just to reiterate, if we, uh, with the grant, we're required uh, to let the project by July of 2020, not this July, but July of 2020. And that's detailed a little further. Uh, just to refresh your memory, this was phase A, which is from uh, the Concho River going back toward Beauregard. This is a, just a shot of the design concept from, uh, which would be A and B, all the way from the river down to uh, 6th Street or Houston Heart. And this is the segment that's phase C, uh, which would go from the river back to Washington. So today we're going to talk about we uh, move forward after getting the grant with uh, looking at uh, what we would recommend uh, as our final proposed scope to move forward. And that uh, concept includes the final concept design and exhibits for a phases A, B, and C. So all three of those phases. We would do construction documents uh, and construction of the water and sewer utilities for phase A, B, and C as well, doing that throughout the whole corridor. And then construction documents for the street and pedestrian elements for phases A and B. Uh, just to touch a little bit on that as to why is that we kind of wanted to go ahead and do B at this time because as grant opportunities come forward in the future, if those are shovel-ready projects, we're much uh, more equipped and ready to apply for and get those future grant dollars. And then, of course, in this phase, construction of phase A itself. The total estimated uh, project cost for all of those elements listed above, including the construction, is a little over $10 million. I did want to note we assumed, in this case, since John's not here, that we would be waiving the permitting fees uh, from the city. So since John's at jury duty, I thought we'd slip that in. No, that's what we had talked about originally, so I just wanted to make sure we uh, noted that. So today we're talking about, we sent out requests for qualifications uh, to select a firm to actually do our construction uh, documents on all of that and then who would oversee throughout construction of the project. We received four uh, proposals from four firms. We actually interviewed all four of them. Um, the selection team uh, uh, recommends moving forward with Centurion Planning and Design. We had a good group uh, who did that selection. Harry and the mayor were both on that team as well. And uh, as you'll see with our recommendation, <clears throat> we look at the professional services and the scope as we talked about in the prior slide. As I noted, it's a much larger, um, complex project than you would see with most of our projects because of all of the personal contact with property owners, all of the disciplines used, and the oversight of the project. Uh, the professional services uh, scope fee would be $2.1 million. To go back over our history, what council approved as a proposed funding source at a prior time was to utilize our funding from our streets uh, that was set aside for this area. You, uh, we set aside money from uh, the North Tier Zone, uh, the South, Cosa DC, uh, Stormwater, Wastewater, Water, Hot, TxDOT, which gave us a total of a little over $11 million. What we're proposing uh, as the current plan for this is to take that uh, that you've priorly looked at. Um, some of these numbers uh, have altered a little bit, but um, most current projections of what's being generated. So the street dollars uh, remain the same. We're recommending utilizing uh, 171,000 approximately from the north tiers because the design of phase B, a uh, portion of that is in the north tier zone. So we, we uh, Andy balanced that out based on the amount of blocks that were being done there. Um, those numbers could adjust, I'll just say, as we as we look at all of this, once final numbers come in and things are bid, these numbers could adjust some. Uh, the south tier zone, of course, we're doing a lot of work in the south tier, so we're utilizing all of those. That number is a little different from what was in your original plan because Tina updated the numbers based on current trends and what's projected to, to be generated in that fund. 
Uh, you'll see the amount of Coast DC money recommended, uh, stormwater. Sewer and water fund, the amount recommended to utilize has gone up in those because actually what we're doing now is designing and constructing all of those throughout A, B, and C. So those are the actual projected cost for that full amount. So we visited with Allison about that, and she's good with it. And then, of course, your tech stock grant. Um, so you'll see a total of a little over $10 million project. Uh, remaining dollars in the fund are about 1.7, and those would be uh, designated as a contingency for the project or for future phases uh, that come along. So Andy's going to talk a little bit about the schedule um, and how we'll implement that. But before we go to that, do you have any questions on, on this part so far? We received the grant in what year? We just got the notice this past year in 2018. So in 2018. And so they give us two years to let the project. I'll let Andy speak to that. He's okay. really the grant guru. Good morning. Uh, yes, Mayor, that is correct. Basically, they have a schedule based on the funding cycle of when you have to bid the project by. Um, and so for the grant cycle that we were in, it has to be by July of 2020. And so if we wanted it in July of 2019, they're not going to let the funds on that? Uh, it would have to be by July 2020. You can do it early. You just can't do you it You can't later. do it later, yes. So what's the potential of doing it sooner than later? Um, I'm just going to go through the uh, schedule here, and, and that'll, that'll help explain and answer that question, Mayor. But essentially, um, with the amount of complexity with this project, we have a very aggressive schedule. Um, there's a lot of uh, construction documents that need to be put together by uh, Centurion and their team of, of experts. Um, so as you see here, we're going to start initially with the utilities for phases A, B, and C. Um, they're anticipating a notice to proceed next month. So as we have uh, a decision today, hopefully, we can move forward with finalizing the contract and getting them started. Uh, then we have um, some middles for the 30, 60, 90, and then the final phases. Uh, those are just different design submittals that this, the city staff has a chance to review and comment on. They're just milestones that help us along the way, so that way we know where we're going and where we're heading and can give feedback to them. And then, uh, as you can see there for the utilities, again, this is A, a B, and C, we'd be letting the utilities in October of 2019 with a notice to proceed anticipated in early of 2020. And then construction completion, about a six to eight month uh, construction schedule. So we'll be looking at fall of 2020 for the completion of the utilities. And just to clarify what Andy's saying, as you notice this, what he's doing is breaking the projects into two things. We have a utilities construction under one that he's moving forward with quickly. I'm sorry. The utilities component as he's moving forward quickly, and then he's going to get into the actual streetscape and street itself. So to move this project effectively, he feels it's best that, you know, you go and put all those utilities in where you're tearing things up, and then you come through with the other. So that's why you're seeing this as you watch him go through this in two different components. And when you talk about utilities, are you talking water and sewer only, or are you also talking bearing of power lines? For the city standpoint, it would be water and sewer only. However, we'd be coordinating with the other franchise utilities that utilize the cities right away, and then we would give them our schedule and work with them for them to make whatever necessary arrangements that they would have to make. And so those um, burials of power lines are inclusive of these um, numbers in terms of reality? The uh, relocation of franchise utilities uh, is not included as part of this. That would be required as part of the coordination. Um, we have franchise utility agreements. Um, we're going to need to go back through and see if the city requests overhead to go underground, whose cost responsibility that would be. So some more evaluation is necessary on our part. So a question with that. Would the burial or the removal of the power lines to go underground be included in what Centurion is coordinating for us? Yes, that is correct, that they would be coordinating with the franchise utilities. And then we would see where there'd be conflicts or where maybe to their best interest to uh, remove, move, uh, relocate utilities, and, their own utilities. And when we did the cost estimates up front, which were based on half's approval, uh, half who did it for us originally, did they take into account projected cost to work with burying the power lines? I do not believe that they did. Um, 
they looked at lighting and things of that nature for the city standpoint, but not necessarily. They, as part of their scope, they were helping us with the grant application, but Half Associates was not coordinating with the franchise utilities at that point because we were so early on in the uh, project. That's more of a design uh, phase coordination. So we'll we have... came up with total dollars way back when in terms of what the project would cost. So the question mark is on the original 17 million for the entire corridor, those costs came with some details in terms of what was inclusive in those total numbers. So the question mark goes back to when we did the original estimates for what this project would cost. That was always on the laundry list of things to do. So is that included? As best I recall, and Andy will have to look, Andy and Russell will have to look back at those exact documents. But as I recall, we mentioned that as well in those cost estimates as half projected. So what we will do in this as we move forward is make sure that as uh, Centurion reviews all of this, that those are included in the design. As, as I understood it, council placed that as a top priority above various things that could happen in this project, that and lighting. And so those will be in the top uh, design component that is included within the cost projections. Any additional questions? Probably, but keep going. Okay. So looking at the phase A design, and as Rick mentioned previously, we will be designing both phase A and B. B, because it's not necessarily ready for construction now, we will be pushing that design deadlines a little bit farther along. I think in general, the different phases have about an additional 30 days. But we're focusing on phase A primarily from a schedule because that's our grant dollars at work right there. So if we have the notice to proceed in February, they'd be working through the conceptual design phase. And what that is, is if you've seen um, in the past half put together some conceptual designs, um, I think there were some done previously. I know this project's been around for quite a few years is combining all the thoughts and ideas into one clear design criteria for us to go forward both A, B, and C, so that way we have consistency as we move forward with the future phases. So it would be accumulating all that and then going on to the 30, 60, 90, and then the construction document submittal at the end of 2019. At that point, then the city would have the chance to review, offer feedback and comments, and then they would be submitting, they being Centurion, uh, to TxDOT in February of 2020. And that would then allow TxDOT a few months to do their review, offer their comments and feedback, and then we could let phase A in June of 2020 in time for the deadline. So as I mentioned before, Mary, you mentioned about trying to accelerate it. There is a lot of time investment by Centurion and their team, and there's, it's a very significant effort to pull that in. I'd love to move this forward as quick as we can, but with the amount of effort that they have to put in there, I would say, it's going to be difficult to get to June 2020, which we will do, but trying to accelerate even quicker may be a challenge for them. And we have um, originally the entire project from Washington Street to Houston Heart was projected to be somewhere over 17 million. I think the total cost estimate was 20, about 20 million. 20. That was phases A and B. Uh, since I've been with the city, I've not seen a cost estimate for Phase C, which Phase C is from the river to Washington. The river to Washington? What are you? Phase phase C. The river to Washington. Okay, so A and B is going to take us from where to where? The Concho River to the Loop, and that's the estimated cost of about $20 million. Okay, so that doesn't include the Washington C. And um, go ahead. Any other questions before I? So, um, I just thank you, Mayor. Um, phase A and B is covered under the um, figure that we were shown earlier, the ten million plus dollars. Is uh, that construction of Phase B, construction of Phase A, and Centurion's design? So that was just A and, a and design. Correct. And utilities. Proposed scope is the final concept and design of, of phases A, B, and C. Uh, the construction documents and construction of the water and utilities, so it's, it's actual construction and design of all of those. 
and it's the construction documents of A and B and the actual construction of A. I know that gets to be a lot. And right. the reason we're going forward with the construction documents on B, you could take that out now if, if we didn't want to do that. But the reason we're going through, forward with the construction documents is because we think it increases our grant opportunities in the future to have a shovel-ready project. So the dollars that are presented to us today are reflective of construction documents with street and pedestrian elements, but we do not have a final design element, so how do we come up with the numbers without a final design element? The, the design element is based on the, the, dollar, the projections that you received from half back on our original proposal, so we will not have a final dollar until that actually is bid. Now, as Centurion moves forward with their actual design, the construction documents, they're able to utilize their connections and sources with other uh, entities who construct to see and firm up those cost estimates. But I won't have an exact dollar amount until we actually bid the project. So the design element would be expected to fit within the dollars as that's, prescribed. And I want to reiterate, that's a, a point that... Uh, the committee and the mayor and Harry made as we had these discussions with Centurion is that you know, the project has a budget. So we need to make that design fit within the proposed budget. And so those are, just as you pointed out early on, there are components such as the power lines that need to be buried, and that has to fit within the budget. All right, so the other part I want to make sure we do, because I don't like picking winners and losers in terms of streets. And so um, I feel strongly that those businesses that are on um, Chadburn between Concho to Beauregard are certainly important, but I also believe strongly that the other blocks and those businesses are also very important. So I want to make sure that in this conversation that we realize that we can't let decades go by from initial to final project. Yeah, this project has, as we've defined it, this scope A has a very defined project timeline as Andy went through that TxDOT requires us to utilize within receiving the grant dollars. So, um, you know, you see when it has to let by, it has to start by. So uh, this one is, is pretty defined. And so if we said the following, that bearing of the power lines, doing the sewer water, and lighting from point A to, or sections A and B, we're not going to complete those elements during the entire corridor, but only those elements from actual construction for phase A. And those are um, components that, you know, you could decide later on when you get the actual bid dollars in, you know, if this is coming in in a, in a format that offers you more flexibility with funding, then there may be ways that you could progress with, you know, certain elements of phase B. Although you may want to, on those, wait until you apply for that grant because you can leverage those dollars. Harry. I just want to reiterate a little bit of what Rick said earlier because we're not spending a lot of time on it. I want businesses along this particular corridor to understand that Centurion is going to visit with them on multiple occasions to get their input, to talk about how this street construction is going to affect their business. They, uh, Centurion spent a lot of time last week when we met with them to talk about that interaction and how important it is for the final product. important. Billy? Um, Rick, could you go back to um, the slide that showed the expenditures, um, please? That one. Um, where it talks about this, the funds coming from the streets, the $2.5 million, is that coming from the uh, money that we had to do our street projects throughout San Angelo? As you recall on this one, the way this project kind of started was that there was a portion of money set aside uh, to repave a portion of Chadburn. 
Uh, and so when looking at that, we talked to the street group and said, okay, if we repave this portion of Chadburn, how long is it going to be before we revisit that? They said, well, you know, it'll be whatever, 15 years. And so we said, well, is this an opportunity to look at leveraging those dollars that are set aside on Chadburn uh, for additional uh, dollars to actually do a bigger project? And so those were dollars that were already allocated toward the Chadburn Street anyway. We just chose to leverage those with other dollars, and instead of just putting asphalt over the top, do this project, which is, and as you recall, this project will go back with concrete, so we should have a much more lasting product. So Rick, if, if you were asked the question, um, how would you answer it? And the question being, how did Chadburn Street move up in the list of priorities over other streets that need, desperately need attention? I would say in this case, those dollars were allocated, the 2.5, for the, a portion of Chadburn to just pave. Uh, and we, as staff, are charged with looking at opportunities of how we can leverage other dollars to make projects happen. So the streetscape construction idea had been one that had been on the table for a while, and, and we thought this was an opportunity to leverage existing dollars already allocated for Chadburn uh, with additional dollars to make something happen that had been envisioned for a while. And did some of it hinge on us being able to get grant dollars for, for this project where we wouldn't necessarily be able to get grant dollars on Southwest or College Hills? You're exactly right. There are, there are opportunities we look for all the time on leveraging grants. So I'll use another example that may be coming up in the future, which is similar to this one, which is a Safe Routes to School program. So you can leverage dollars to get um, sidewalks that may run along the, uh, the street construction itself that get kids back and forth to school. So similar to this one, there are certain criteria. You know, clearly uh, there, there are projects that wouldn't qualify for the Safe Routes to School because you're not near a school. In this case, you had to be on uh, a certain type of roadway within proximity to certain elements, and so this worked for this grant. Thank you, that's good. Uh, I think I just have one more question, and it's about Centurion. And I was looking at the um, results of the interviews and how they were ranked, and it looked like Centurion and Freeze Nichols both had the exact same ranking. But one of the comments on Centurion said, um, there may need to be some adjustment on project approach. Is it possible for you to share what that comment uh, just, means? Most of that was on timing and how we approach the timing going into the project to complete it within the time frame it needed to be complete. So what the team does is looks at the initial things that are submitted we do the interview and then uh, choose based on who we want. After that, we try to negotiate to make sure we, that we can work with that group. So in that particular case, talking about the project approach, uh, Andy and his group uh, talked with them saying, you know, as it comes into how we have to meet these timelines, uh, we need you to adjust your approach and how you're going to hit it and get running with it. And so they were able to do that easily and meet the timelines that we require. Um. The other thing that I noticed, there seemed to be really more comments in favor of Freeze Nichols, such as 15 similar TxDOT grant projects in the last eight years. That was for Freeze Nichols. Uh, experience with San Angelo. Know the complexities of the project. They have innovative ideas. Um, so with those same rankings, in reading all the comments, I noticed those comments for Freeze Nichols, but I didn't notice similar comments for Centurion. Um, and since they had the same ranking, now based on our discussion on item A on regular agenda, where it looks like you know some things were missed, maybe I understand better now why Centurion got that project. Well, and there's there are other components that the committee took into place. So you'll see that Centurion partnered with Park Hill Smith. Cooper. And so uh, while Centurion itself, as you know, is a local firm, um, they might not personally have as much experience. They did partner with a group that does. 
And so uh, we felt confident that the group they're partnering with uh, is good. One thing I kind of like about this approach um, is historically we've had, you know, an out-of-town firm um, that comes in and does the work, and they often will try to partner with someone locally, which is good. In this case, we have a, a local firm leading the charge who is partnering with a bigger firm. So it kind of flips who's in charge, and, and I like that because as we move forward, if there's a problem on the project, I have a local firm to go to and say, okay, I know you're partnering with this one who's helping you out, but you're the one here who's, who's in charge. So uh, on the other hand, I, I think that they're going to do a good job. They have a real passion for the project, and that's good. Well, I'm glad that we're using a local firm as well, but since they had the exact same ranking, you know, I yeah. was was looking closer. I, I, I will be honest. It was a tough decision. Yeah. It was there. There were two firms that really rose to the top. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Thank you, Rick. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Do I have further questions from anyone? Okay. Can um, to Harry is as presented. moved to present as, to approve as presented. Do I have a second? With Lane seconding, do we have public comment? City Council, Steve Hampton. Uh, Mrs. Du Billy, I, if you keep asking those kind of questions, I'm not going to be able to run against you. I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 those are very good probing questions. I appreciate that, and, and you're setting a good, good example for the rest of the council. Uh, we, uh, the question I have is, uh, or my comment is rather, uh, that this uh, uh, agreement be uh, voted down, uh, that uh, I have uh, approached this stand before and, and stated that uh, I don't believe that this is going to help the city. It's just a, it's a, uh, an excessive uh, beautification, a downtown beautification. Uh, we have uh, other places uh, where the money could be uh, better used that was brought up. Uh, and I think this is going to choke the traffic flow uh, downtown, uh, not only uh, uh, and hurt the businesses as uh, as Harry uh, uh, mentioned. So uh, this money could be used better in, in but, uh, Butler Farms and Southwest and, and College Hills, uh, um, except for the grant money, except for the grant money. Uh, well, you realize tears money is not available for Butler Farms? Well, I think that you've milked uh, every, uh, every uh, Just a point. organization uh, that we've, uh, to bring this amount together. Uh, so I don't think that I think you're trying awful hard to get uh, uh, this beautification downtown, and it's not going to help downtown like you want it to be. To thank you. Thank you very much. Further public comment? With no further public comment, we will take a vote. All in favor of approving item B, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 4-0. We just make a note just for the record with a uh, four zero with one abstention. Four zero with one abstention. You want to get Harry, I mean, you want to get Tommy and tell him to come back in? Uh, Mayor, yes, while we're waiting for him, I just have a question maybe for Russell or Andy or Rick. The master agreement with Freeze Nichols that was signed on September 2015, what's the length of that agreement? I believe you're referring to our IDIQ contract. And this is uh, the Chadburn project that we brought to you today is actually outside of that agreement. But that agreement was for three years with two one-year extension options. Uh, you know, and we've extended those one one additional year, and that happened in uh, September of 2015. So, okay, so that's not a long term. I read that in some of the background information. I was just unclear what it was about and the length of the agreement. So. Right. So that 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 contract was primarily to help us focus on our uh, capital improvement, our bond funding plan and strategy with that. So um, we felt Sorry, like this, this this item's closed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> We'll now move into regular agenda item C.
the first reading and public hearing of an ordinance to change Ellis Street to Easton, East Houston Heart Expressway Frontage Road. Over 2,900 foot length of this street's right of way beginning at Montauk Avenue and continuing east to its terminus past Smith Boulevard to the East Houston Heart Expressway ramp. Welcome. Good morning, Mayor, Council, uh, Aaron Vinoy, Planning and uh, Development Administrator here with the City of San Angelo. I'm sitting in uh, for John James as he's out on jury duty, and we'll also have uh, Senior Planner Hillary Buecher coming up next to present some other cases as well. So this is a street name change um, from Ellis Street to Houston Heart Express Frontage Road. It's just another one of those extensions that we found uh, in our city that just has a a name of a road that doesn't really fit. Uh, we had a business uh, approach us to get it named to an appropriate name, uh, Houston Heart Express Frontage Road. Um, it, the whole link that goes across is about 1.1 uh, acres uh, all the way from Montague Avenue to the terminus past Smith Boulevard. It's in um, District 4, uh, Councilwoman Gonzalez in the Paul Ann neighborhood. So we did um, look at this for what do we want to, does it need to change, does it not need to change. We did talk to several departments internally and externally. TxDOT is in supportive, um, the police department is in supportive, uh, so is our um, uh, operations department as the name is confusing. Um, there is another segment of Ellis Street that does not go in line with this segment and so changing it to East Houston Heart Expressway, uh, Expressway Frontage Road is makes more sense. Um, so looking at that you can see here this is Montague right there. Smith is right here that goes out uh, to Paul Ann. There's not a whole lot of development along that frontage road yet, so if we can go ahead and get ahead of the, of the game of changing that, which everyone seems to be in support for, that's gonna help the naming when we go to address uh, businesses or residential uh, areas off of that road, they're gonna be able to have a, a more logical place uh, to go. Uh, let me clear that up. Here's just kind of a zoomed in. We did send out six notices. Um, we did not receive any in favor or in opposition. Um, staff does recommend changing the name, as did Planning Commission back in December. Um, and with that, I would take any questions you have. I would assume that very few people knew that it was not Houston Hart. Well, in fact, the street uh, names out there on the corners actually say Houston Hart. Yes, and <laughs> so... so it was never a sign on Houston Heart that said this is now Ellis Street. Uh, well, I, it probably was before they put the Houston Heart signs out there, but it's been many, many years since those signs were out there. And so it's just really an internal change on our maps internally to change that name formally to the Houston Heart Expressway. Move to approve as presented. Second. Any public comment? If no public comment. We will take a vote. All in favor of approving item C, say aye. Aye. With none opposed, it passes 5-0. We will now go into item D, and item D is first reading and public hearing for one, an ordinance for CP 18-08, an amendment to the City of San Angelo's comprehensive plan changing certain lands from the neighborhood center future land use to a neighborhood future land use being 0.97 acres of land located at 3210-3230 Abilene Street and two, an ordinance of Z18-23, a rezoning from the general commercial CG zoning district to the single family RS1 zoning district being 0.48 acres located at 3218 3214, 3210 Abilene Street. Welcome, Hillary. Thank you. My name is Hillary Buecher. I'm a senior planner with the planning division. We're going to move on to comprehensive plan amendment 1808 and rezoning 1823 SOHA and the city of San Angelo was also enjoined in this. We're looking at 0.97 acres total. It's northeast of Abilene and Howell in SMD number six, DeWitt's district in the Bluffs neighborhood. As you can see, the current um, neighborhood center future land use is the designation and the zoning is RS1 and CG. 
the applicant originally came in to rezone the properties that are shown in red and do the comprehensive plan amendment. The staff saw the need to go ahead and include the comprehensive plan amendment for this existing residential and already zoned RS1 property. We mailed out 13 notices. We received two in favor and one in opposition. And what was the one in opposition? They were concerned about the addition of the homes and how it might affect crime and trash, um, just um, other nuisances that come with development, maybe. And the two in favor's comments were what? They did not comment specifically. They just showed a letter in opposition or in support. So staff is recommending approval of the comprehensive plan amendment, changing the future land use designation from neighborhood center to neighborhood, and approval of the rezoning from the general commercial to single family residential. As well, on December 17th, planning commission unanimously recommended approval of both cases. Does anyone have any questions? I'm gonna start with Billy because it is in her district. Um, I do have questions. My first question, what's the difference between neighborhood center and neighborhood? So neighborhood looks more toward residential development. Neighborhood center focuses more on neighborhood-sized commercial developments. So a small office, a small retail services for neighborhood center, whereas the neighborhood looks for future development of residential. Thank you. And the one in um, notice in opposition, I just wondered if that individual happens to be present. I guess not, I don't see anyone uh, moving. And I'd just like to, to comment on that. I did read that um, opposition notice and it seemed that they were concerned about additional crime in the area if you build new homes and uh, people going through their trash. Um, and I was just, you know, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to talk to that individual. I would have loved to understand how vacant lots around you was more desirable than new homes where, you know, hopefully they would be well maintained and it would reduce the crime rate because you have neighbors looking after neighbors. And I really thought this was in Tom Thompson's area <laughs> until I started doing my homework last night and I was like, oops, I missed the opportunity to go see that. So um, I just, um, those were my comments, my questions, and I would like to move to approve, Mayor. Move to approve by Billy. Do I have a second? And a second by Harry. Do we have public comment? If no public comment, we will take a vote. All of those in favor say aye. 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 With none opposed, mash motion passes 5-0. We'll move to item E. What I would like to do, because it's very long, is I'm going to read one at a time, but we will vote on all at the same time. So we're not gonna take individual votes, but I don't wanna read all of it at one time period because I'll forget what we said on item five by the time we get to it. So we'll take them on one, at one on one. So item E1 is an ordinance of CP18-09, an amendment to the city of San Angelo's comprehensive <laughs> plan changing certain lands from the neighborhood center future land use to the neighborhood future land use being 0.97 acres of land located at 2900 to 2920 Houston Street. And I should say that should anyone be opposed to not approving one of these, we can pull it out separately. So it doesn't have to be approved all at once if there is a reason to do so. Mayor, one and two yes. are together, if you'd like to maybe- Okay, uh, so let you. me do two then. Yeah. An ordinance for Z18-24, a rezoning from the neighborhood commercial CN zoning district to the single family RS1 zoning district being 0.48 acres of land located at 2920, 2916, and 2912 Houston Street. Hey, Hillary Buecher again. I just wanted to let you guys know these items were put on this consolidated uh, agenda item because they had received no public opposition, were recommended for approval by staff, and were unanimously received recommendation for the Planning Commission, so we'll move forward with that. This is Comprehensive Plan Amendment 1809 and rezoning 1824. Again, the Comprehensive Plan Amendment is the entire area. The rezoning that was in, uh, started by the applicant is actually the area in red. We're looking at a total of 0.97 acres northeast of Houston Heart, uh, Houston Street and West Houston Heart Expressway Frontage Road, SMD number two in the Bluffs neighborhood. 
So as you can see, the future land use of this area is predominantly neighborhood center in the area that is outlined. The zoning is actually RS1 and CN, so the, again, the applicant came in to rezone the property and to fix the comprehensive plan amendment. Staff initiated the area in Maroon to clear that up with existing residential development. We mailed out 21 notices. We received one in favor and zero in opposition. What was the one in favor? Any comments? No, ma'am, just okay. in favor. So staff is recommending approval of the comprehensive plan amendment and the rezoning as well on December 17th. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of both cases. Do I have questions or comments for Hillary on items E1 and 2? All right, let's move on to item 3, an ordinance for PD 18-05, a rezoning from the general commercial, heavy commercial, CGCH zoning district to a planned development PD zoning district to allow for uses permitted within the general commercial CG zoning district and a shared sign plan for off-site signage being 9.93 acres of land located at 4206 South College Hills Boulevard and 3121 and 3131 Sunset Drive. So we'll move on to this plan development, 1805. It is a joint application between United Supermarket and Texas Bank. We're looking at 9.93 acres, again, at the corner of College Hills and Sunset Drive, SMD number five, Mr. Carter's district, in the Vista Del Arroyo neighborhood. So the current zoning is general commercial, heavy commercial, and the current future land use is commercial. So the applicant came in wanting to do a joint sign. So this is the location of the new joint sign. Uh, the current zoning ordinance does not allow off-site signage, and um, the Market Street wanted to have signage along College Hill, so they've put in this application. There's an existing Albertsons uh, Market Street sign on that side. So this is the proposed sign. Um, you can see it's about uh, 15 feet tall. It has both Texas Bank and Market Street, along with masonry accents and the fuel at the very bottom. We mailed out 33 notices and received one in favor and zero in opposition. So staff is recommending approval of the rezoning from general commercial, heavy commercial, to the planned development to allow for uses permitted in the CG zoning district, as well as a shared sign plan to allow offsite signage subject to five conditions of approval. And on December 17th, Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this case as well. You wanna, do you have any questions, Lane? No questions, I'm okay with this. I like the consolidation factor of having them both together, so I'm okay. okay. Um, any further questions from council? Do I have a motion then? Oh, oh wait. Don't take a moment or Oh yeah, to, sorry, that's what we're doing. Yes. We're moving on to item four, E4, an ordinance for Z18-25, a rezoning from the low-rise multifamily residential RM-1 zoning district to the neighborhood commercial CN zoning district being 0.915 acres of land located at 5205 South Bryant Boulevard. This is rezoning 1825 Von Rosenberg. We're looking at a little bit less than an acre at the corner of South Bryant Boulevard and Kimberly Lane. The rezoning request is from RM1 to CN. It's in SMD number one, Tommy Hebert's district in the Glenmore neighborhood. So the future land use is currently neighborhood center, so the neighborhood commercial would fall <laughs> in line with the future land use, and as well, the current zoning is RM1. We mailed out 12 notices and received zero in favor and zero in opposition. So staff is recommending approval of the rezoning from the low-rise multifamily residential to neighborhood commercial on December 17th, Planning Commission also unanimously recommended approval. Tommy? Uh, I have had no calls on this. I'm in favor of this. I understand they're gonna uh, likely build uh, more housing there, so that will add to our tax base. So uh, I, I am in favor. Okay. Then do I have a motion? Tommy, you wanna make the motion? Oh wait, I, uh, I'm going to remember what I told you a while ago. <laughs> we are not taking a vote. We're almost there, Mayor. Okay. Next item five, an ordinance of Z18-27, a rezoning from the general commercial, heavy commercial, CGCH zoning district and single family residential RS1 zoning district to the low rise multifamily residential RM-1 zoning district being 1.18 acres of land located at 3608 North Chadburn. You're on. 
Okay, the final rezoning in this consolidated agenda is 1827 Brightmara. We're looking at a little bit over an acre of land at the corner of North Chadburn and East 37th Street. We are looking to rezone from CGCH and RS1 to RM1. Um, I'm sorry, the council district is incorrect there. Yeah. Um, so we will get that updated, but it is in the northern part of town at Chadburn and East 37th. The future land use is commercial for this area, and the current zoning you can see here is split. We mailed out 19 notices and received zero in favor and zero in opposition. So for that, staff is recommending approval of the rezoning to low-rise multifamily residential, and on December 17th, Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval as well. Do I have questions or comments from council? I'm just disappointed that I didn't have I didn't have one of that five right there. <laughs> so can can Billy Lane and I make the motion? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. With that said, do I have a motion to approve item E one two three four and five? Move to approve. Lane okay. moves to approve, and Tommy has a second on that. We will now open up for public comment. No public comment. We will take a vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. With none opposed, item E, 1 through 5, is approved 5-0. We will now move into item F, which is the first reading and public hearing of an ordinance approving the abandonment of approximately 14,778 square feet of King Mill Drive and 14,777 square feet of Wedgwood Court public right-of-way located was block within block 101 section 16c bentwood country club estates hillary hi we are going to move on to the right-of-way abandonment of king mill drive and wedgwood court again this is located in the bentwood area we are looking at approximately 14 almost 15,000 square feet of both both roads Do we um, have a picture of any kind anything up would you like me to wait for just a second yeah okay One thousand one, one thousand. Okay, time's up. <laughs> one thousand three. I did not write that. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We're good. Okay, we will continue on. This is southeast of Beatty Road and Overhill Drive intersection, so the south part of Bentwood, if you can uh, imagine that area. The property is currently zoned RM1, low-rise multifamily, with a neighborhood future land use, SMD number one, Hebert's district, in the Country Club neighborhood. Um, there is an associated drainage easement release that will be coming forward um, next council that they were put together for planning commission, so you will see this on your next council. So staff is recommending approval of the portion of the Coldest Act for King Mill Drive and Wedgwood Court public right-of-way subject to two conditions of approval. And on December 17th, planning commission unanimously recommended approval as well. This is um, in reference to a plat that is being recorded. They had asked for a private road. So these streets were actually constructed with a previously approved plat. It was section 16C. The new plat that has been approved as one of the conditions of approval, they had to seek abandonment for the private road. That is 16F. So does anyone have any questions? I do. There was reference to drainage. Uh, I'd like you to go back to that and talk through that drainage sure. issue because I think there's been consistent challenge I know from Butler Farms people with drainage issues and I want to make sure we all understand what's going on sure. and I think um, Andy can help me speak to this as well this uh, easement release that will be coming forward was actually part of a previous approval so it was actually for section 11 so it's an old one that I believe is no longer being used with the addition of the road but um, Andy. Oh, you come up. I'm sorry. Uh, good morning. Yes, good morning. they will be redirecting the drainage. Um, they will be um, currently, as you can see, they have the uh, the right of way for the drainage, but they will be bringing it from 
Wedgwood over to King Mill Drive and then coming across at about a 45 degree angle to the south and west. Can and you then, draw that on there, Andy? Um, let's see, the roads are going to come like this. And so the drainage, they're going to use a curbing gutter there. And so it'll come like this, the drainage will come here, and it'll come across actually probably a little more like that. I apologize, it's a little messy there. Um, <laughs> not to scale either. Uh, but there, there's a culvert underneath Beatty Road that goes directly to the lake. And so we're, we're in the middle of reviewing the drainage study now. They've submitted their first submittal. We've issued, I think there are approximately five comments back that they need to address. And I believe we recently received a resubmittal, but I haven't had a chance to look at it. Call the sex and looping it around. That is correct, yes, and making, the, making it private. Since we you know, have this new big document called the Stormwater Drainage Program. We, this drainage is now taking everything directly into the lake. Is that what you said? And we're not correct. concerned about that? No, there are different criteria on how to satisfy the requirements of the Stormwater Design Manual, Mayor. And if there is a direct access to a water body, that is one of the ways that they can do that. One of our comments back to them that they didn't address in our initial submittal was to make sure that culvert under Beatty Road was large enough to be able to handle the additional runoff. Uh, so we are making sure that they, down, uh, they size properly everything downstream that will be impacted. And do we risk any issues as it relates to approving this today without the drainage issue attached to this vote? This and why are they separated? Um, the drainage easement actually only requires a resolution, so it will be coming on the second reading of the right-of-way abandonment. The right-of-way abandonment will take two readings, so um, they will both be on the agenda next time. All right, Tommy, do you want, and then Harry, I'll have you after him. Okay, Tommy. Andy, a uh, couple of questions for you. Um, at, at this point, do, does, uh, does the plan that they have presented create any problems in your mind with the drainage that they, and they haven't answered all the the points yet, but at this point, do you have, does uh, engineering have concerns on the, on the drainage? Um, if they address... If they address the comments, okay. then, we, then and they address them satisfactorily according to the design manual, then, then we feel comfortable with it. But until I get a chance to review the resubmittal, I can't specifically say yay or nay at this point. And when you say if, mm -hmm. they have an option? If the no, word no, if would indicate. No, Mayor, the, if they don't address them in this one, they'll be doing another resubmittal. So yeah, there, there is no doubt that they are gonna be re satisfying the requirements of the drainage manual. It's just whether they addressed them appropriately in this resubmittal. So we, you will know that, or it, it's not gonna come back to us until, you, until those things have been addressed. Is that, is that an accurate statement until the drainage issues have been addressed? Um, we were planning on it coming to the next meeting, so as if engineering can satisfy their comments by then, we will be bringing it forward. Okay, because I know, I know we've got we've got flooding and drainage issues all over this town. So uh, you know, meetings that I'm in with people that are doing this sort of thing, uh, they they hear me talk about you know we we've got to make sure you address the drainage and f the flooding problems that um, the city raises just just because of all the problems that we have. So. Um, I would encourage, maybe encourage you to encourage them to get their responses so that we can have it um, on the on the on the next agenda if that's when it's going to come. So, um, I, I, I would encourage them to to work on that. Yes, sir. They have. I, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe they've resubmitted. It just hasn't had a chance to go through to the um, review process okay. at the point okay. on the resubmittal. Okay. Good. So, and, and yes, uh, to your point, I definitely agree on the fact that there are drainage issues. And being relatively new to the city, I'm seeing more and more every day. And so that's one of the charges that we have an engineering department has is to make sure that we are addressing within our ordinances, within our design manual, the best that we can, a lot of the stormwater issues that are out there, both existing and not creating new ones. Well, and I think I've gotten a distinct impression from this council, we don't want to do anything that is going to create problems even five years down the road, 10 years down the road, to the best of our ability on what we're approving today. So um, thank you all for being diligent in, in doing that. Um, Marie, go ahead. Oh, did you have I, I was just going to say, uh, I, I have had no comments on this. Um, so. Um, as long as we can address our drainage issues, you know, I'm, I'm okay with what we're talking about today. Harry? 
I guess I will reiterate what's been said. Uh, I don't want to create another Foster Road. So whatever we do in this, I want to make sure that we're, we're taking care of, as Tommy said, in 15, 20 years down the road when this group is not seated up here. Bottom line is, is we need to make sure that we get ahead of this. And quite honestly, I would have liked to have seen this drainage done before we brought it for this. And I think for future use, that's probably going to be the way that we'd, we'd like to direct staff. Don't bring it up here until you've got that done. Uh, I, I'll, I'll vote for this today, but on the second reading, I, if we don't have the drainage studies done, I will not vote for it. Thank you for those comments. Further questions or comments, an, Lane? Do you have an elevation map that would show the grades? Not currently Not available, currently. but yeah, okay. as part of their submittal, as part yeah. of the, the drainage study, that they do have to show contours proposed and existing okay. and things of that nature. And I think, if I remember right, um, that was one of our comments back on this one, is, is their contours did not properly show proposed versus existing. I could be confusing projects, but I'm pretty sure that was one of my comments back on this one. I think Harry um, stated it the way um, I support this in that if we don't have the drainage study or the drainage plan in place, we'll pull the second reading of this and not go forward with it without the drainage at the same point in time. So we'll leave it like that. Okay. okay. Um, further comments from council? All right. I'd, I'd, I'd move approval of uh, item F1 and 2. Okay. Second. And Elaine, second. Um, any public comment? Good morning, Council. Anna Bartosh. Um, Why don't you move the microphone down a little bit so you don't feel like you're having to stretch up to it? <laughs> uh, just a, a comment, uh, looking at other cities, they all have retention ponds, and San Angelo has none that I'm aware of. Uh, I do live on River Valley, which is off of Foster Road, and maybe I'm, I'm not privy to the whole design of what you're doing. It's wonderful what you've done with Foster Road, but basically you've moved the water from the west side of the road to the east side of the road and maybe there's plans to move the water from the east side just right there to the Concho River, I'm not sure. But I was wondering, does anybody ever think about retention ponds that you see in Austin, Houston, and all of the other cities that you go through? Mayor, actually, we do have several of those. Uh, we have an item on the agenda today on Avenue P that, that addresses the uh, detention pond as well. So, yeah, we do. That's one of the uh, uh, resources we do have available to address our drainage. So it is spread around around town. So those are projects that we all actually do as well. There's there's a there's going to be a large retention pond in the Bentwood area with something they are currently working on. So yeah, there we have retention ponds. There's going to be a rather large one out in the Bentwood area. And to your point, Anna, certainly I think we all wish we had some more of those in place a long, long time ago, but yeah. they are in existence and it keeps coming up as a part of the conversations going forward because we understand, again, the huge issues with flooding and we appreciate that. Thanks, thanks for your comments, Anna. Okay, so I have a motion and a second. And so we've had some public comment. Is there further public comment? No further public comment. We will take a vote. All in favor of passing item F, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes 5-0. Item G, update and possible action allowing the city manager to negotiate the buyback provision and execute any related documents regarding the hot in place asphalt recycler, HIPAR. And Shane, I think you're our man on this. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as it states, uh, of course, hot in place asphalt recycling, everybody better knows this is the Benedetti machine. So um, as we're looking at it moving forward, kind of kind of step back just a little bit. Um, as, it, as it states here, we're looking at trying to exercise our buyback provision on the, um, on the machine itself. But kind of little history as we went back and we uh, came out of the Fugro study and with the uh, with the shock shock value that was attached with the Fugro study as to what it would take for the city to uh, bring bring its streets back up to a 70 or a 70 
um, five um, payment index score. Uh, it was one of those things that, uh, which which is considered, you know, very rideable and, and, and a, it's a score that's very acceptable. Uh, we wish all of our streets were up to that par, but uh, again, that's where that's where we'd like to be. You know, and the price tag price tag on that was so large that that we knew that the city wasn't, you know probably ever going to be able to um, unless all of a sudden we started drilling oil wells underneath us and <laughs> we found a new income stream we weren't ever going to be able to uh, to come up with the funding necessary to address all of our streets at the speed and the, and the efficiencies and the, and the manners that we needed to so staff started doing some research we researched multiple different things that that we could do from uh, a staff perspective to try to hopefully um, expedite our ability to address the needs of the streets that we have around town is you know and especially well the last couple of falls you know we get these large rains in 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 the spring and winter and it just it, it, it really shows how how much we really need in the city you know to to start rehabilitating our streets and so as we as we moved along one of the things that we researched was the hot in place asphalt recycling machine not necessarily something that was uh, that was well known in our region or in this actual region of the United States, but something that's uh, that's been going on up in the in the northwest and, and or northeast and taking off in that area, and becoming more and more popular up there in that area. And so it's one of those things that we we looked at it, and uh, we we researched it. We did our background. We took core samples of our streets. We sent them up there. We went up there. We looked at the machine. We watched it work. We uh, looked at the streets that they did and thought that. Uh, after all that, that uh, this this could possibly be a viable option for the city of San Angelo to take a look at and to uh, help us gain a gain some ground on our streets in a, in a quicker manner than than uh, the traditional methods out there, and especially at the at the at the cost comparisons that we were looking at based on the results that they were seeing up there. Uh, where where the machine is is actively working more, or where those machines are more actively working. When you start looking at those costs for rehabilitation costs, and you're and you're and you're talking, you know, five to eight dollars per square yard kind of numbers versus you know thirty five dollars per square yard numbers, and or even reconstruction at over well over a hundred dollars per square yard, this seemed like a really viable option. For us to look at and, and uh, something that we could fit within our existing budget that we currently our existing operating budget that we currently have and well so in december of 16 uh, we asked council to approve the purchase of of this machine and and we purchased it we brought it got it down here and and started to work with it and of course like anything new it, it takes a little while to get used to and figure out and, and get the crews trained and get everybody going and so we we worked on it and then uh, the oil fields started picking back up. I started losing hands and labor, and so it kind of it kind of slowed everything down and put a kink in everything. Came back in last last spring, um, April May time frame, and we really geared back up. Um, got new crew in there, got n new guys in there, and really went to work on it. And what we found is is that the machine the machine does work. Um, it, it does exactly what it's supposed to be doing. However, there's always the however at this part. So. Uh, we have found that due to the n nature of our streets and um, just kind of say hodgepodge, but we do have a multiple multiple types and varieties and kinds of asphalt streets within our town, and not all of those asphalts react the same way uh, to this process, to the heating process, where you're actually heating, coming up, milling, and trying to lay it all back down in, in one smooth process within within about. 500 a 500 foot stretch of one another and so when we look at this process and we look at the different constituents within our street itself and and how it reacts to the heat um, we're not seeing the efficiency that we believe that we need to be seeing out of this machine we're um, uh, based on the price of the machine the price of the staff that is taken to run at the price of the propane and the other uh, expendables that we're that we're using we don't believe that we're seeing the efficiency that this machine needs to see to for us to to continue to move forward with this machine any further. Uh, back when back when we brought it to you, you know, I, I explained to council that this is unknown in our area, and that um, you know I wasn't I wasn't going to stand here and, and say that we need to try this machine out without the buyback clause. So we did have a buyback clause included within within the contract for the purchase of the machine, and. Um, as, as we're standing here today, we believe, staff believes that we need to exercise that buyback provision um, and we need to start looking at other alternative uh, methods to 
for re rehabilitation of our streets. I support 100% taking the option for the buyback. I think we've given this a fair opportunity, and with all the comments I hear from everybody, I think the public will be very happy to have us um, use our buyback option. I agree with that. I have a couple of questions yes, for Shane. Tommy. Um, what plans, Shane, do you have at this point? Um, Benedetti was going to do what it was um, uh, able to do uh, when we purchased it. Now that we won't have it, and or since it really didn't work, what what plans are we looking at to let's just say replace what it was supposed to be able to do? Moving forward, as we look at, and and we know city staff realizes that for us to push forward and and do anything meaningful for our streets, we we are going to have to continue to look for alternative methods. The next the next low cost method is mill and overlay, uh, and it's and it's something that we believe with staff that we can. Those are things that we can do uh, to some extent in house. We, can, you know, we're not going to be able to go out and completely do a, a major arterial in mile, for miles and miles. But we do believe that we can start taking uh, from that aspect, looking at the mill and overlay components uh, in house. That we should be able to start looking at it, it taking those things on. We're still we're still kind of working through some of those numbers and what they look like in the machinery uh, to see what that will and working with our local supplier, uh, of hot mix asphalt to, to determine kind of what that viability looks like moving forward and how that works. But for us to, to make any truly meaningful advancements in our, in our streets, we're going to have to look at processes like that. Now with, you know, there's a mill and overlay process or tried and true processes. They've been around forever. Uh, the biggest thing is the cost and the purchase of the machinery. Um, and then of course, training the staff on the machinery as well too, to operate it. Um, since it's been so long since the city staff has actually been actively um, in the in the paving business, it's, it's going to take. It's, there's going to be a little learning curve to get our guys back up to speed, but it's something that we believe that that is the next low cost option moving forward from a rehabilitative standpoint. Uh, and then, of course, too, we are also constantly looking at new new methods for preservation methods as well, too, um, that are uh, either low cost or same cost as our chip seal program uh, that are hopefully going to be more acceptable um, in uh, appearance and um, actually uh, nobody likes nobody likes hot asphalt and rock so uh, and we definitely don't either at the city it's just right now that's our best low cost method but we're constantly looking at new things like that as well too. I'm glad to hear you say that because I think you know even though this didn't the the Benedetti didn't work as we had hoped and as uh, we thought it was intended, but it didn't work with our streets. I would, I would encourage you to keep looking for the alternatives because of, of the the, the scope of our of our streets uh, that that need uh, lots and lots of work. That we're you know maybe the tried and true need to be just a part of what we do and not the only thing that we do. So I would encourage you to keep looking for for alternates. Sir, we will. We we're always out there looking for looking for something that's low cost uh, that's really going to try to make a difference for us. Great. Do I have further questions? Billy, you have a question? I have a question, Shane, oh, um, around the cost specifics of the Benedetti. How much do we pay for it? And do we know yet what we're looking at, the amount the buyback option will return to us? We paid $1.2 million for the for the Benedetti machine itself, and we are just now starting uh, starting the talks with the Benedetti, Angelo Benedetti Corporation to uh, return the machine, so we haven't actually worked through those those final numbers yet for for a return. So we don't, I don't, I'd, I'd hate to throw out a number and then it, it changed a little bit. So right what now- What are the things though they look at Shane to consider the buyback? What was the buyback contract? What did the, it state? It, it's based on, it's based on usage. How, how much usage that we actually, while we had it in our possession, how much did we actually use the machine in it based on, uh, based on average cost of, of the process itself, um, applying, uh, applying a, a, a number to the square yardage that, that we've actually applied this far. So that's kind of the basic, the, the very basics of the contract itself. So, uh, but we'll, we'll be working out those details uh, with the Benedetti Corporation and her uh, company, whatever they call themselves, and, uh, and be working through those numbers within the next couple of weeks. Now, it's not total hours of operation. If I've 
Remove no, it's, it's not hours operations. It's it's square yardage of, pay, uh, of payments completed. Correct. Harry, you had a comment. Well, since we use this machine in on two of the streets that are in my district, uh, and it didn't work out for us, I certainly want to make sure we go through this buyback clause. But my question is to you, so that the residents in my in my district, especially along those two streets, have an answer is. This, when are we going to get back in and fix the streets now that they're in worse shape than they were before we started this? The, uh, we actually have uh, some funding set aside to address that currently. Uh, we currently have plan uh, working with the engineering division right now to draw up the plans to, to start working on correcting those, those areas. Yeah. This is probably the second most amount of calls that I get is this street's worse now than it was before we started outside of the potholes. So uh, we, we really need to see if we can expedite however we need to uh, on these two streets. Uh, one of which a lot of people use to get to this area and to downtown from the Bell Street area, so. Correct, and, and, and this was, this one, this one street right here was, uh, it, it was the worst by far, so. Uh, yeah. And its constituent yep. and its makeup. So, but no, we we do have we have been working with the engineering department to to work on the designs to to get that fixed and corrected. Okay. Do I have further questions or comments from council? Move to approve. Move, um, Harry's made a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second from Lane. Do I have public comment? Good morning, Lale McClellan Thee, and I just want to say, since this machine didn't work out, thank goodness for the negotiation of the buyout clause or the buyback clause in there. And it, it is nice to to see that when something doesn't work, that um, there's um, we're not it's not just pushed to the side and ignored. So thank you, Mr. Kelton, for admitting that this wasn't the best route. Now we do have recourse. Thank you. Further public comment. Uh, Go ahead Anna, and state your name again, Anna please. Anna Bartosh, and good morning again. Um, I, I agree with uh, the, the buyback, which is really a nice deal to get some money back for a machine that did not work. But is there a way uh, that we can improve materials quality to fix a road that does not erode after the first rainstorm? That seems to be a problem. They fix it, they, not so much with this machine, but just patch it, and the next rainstorm, the pothole is back. Maybe we should go back to the original brick that doesn't have potholes, but might be a bumpy ride, but it's the brick is still there down on Chadburn or that area of town, and it, I like it. <laughs> okay, I'll take you up on that. Let's go for brick. <laughs> That's Todd Costmere. <laughs> Cost. Pretty, pretty expensive. Okay. Further public comment? With no further public comment, we will take a vote. All in support of approving item G. Please say aye. 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 With none opposed, motion passes 5 0. We will now move into item H, which is the update presentation regarding the 2018 Ports to Plains Alliance annual meeting held in Del Rio. October 30th through November 2nd, 2018. And Guy, I have you and John Barrio here to present. Thank you and good morning, Mayor, Council, Mr. Valenzuela, uh, Guy Andrews, Director of Economic Development, and as you had mentioned, our uh, City of San Angelo Development Corporation Director, uh, John Barrio is with us today. Uh, what we would uh, like to do is to show you a video from the conference. The conference was held uh, on October the 31st and November 1st. On October 31st, we were in Del Rio, Texas, and then went across the border to Acuna, Mexico uh, for November 1st. So uh, we're gonna attempt to show that uh, video to you, followed by some uh, comments from Mr. Barrio. And of course, Mayor, since uh, you attended that conference as well, uh, we would welcome any comments that you might have. Thank you. Mayor. Ready? Yes, Bill. Aren't you on that? Um, Ports to Plain Board. Yes, ma'am. Hopefully you can convince them to do 
a conference here in San Angelo in the near future. So. We did one two years ago. And so we will once again attempt to do that. Uh, it was very well received and people truly enjoyed their time here in San Angelo. So we will continue to put our name out there. Thank you. From a concept developed in Lubbock to an international alliance of 167 members, Ports to Plains is a united coalition formed to create and encourage the development of a trade corridor that will provide for our future. We empower communities and businesses as we advocate for safer roads, growth for our community, and funds for improvements to transportation infrastructure. As the Texas Freight Mobility Study recommends, the extension from Laredo to Lubbock is one of the key pieces needed for the projected growth. To address the traffic congestion, safety issues, and high cost of development along the I-35 and I-25 corridors, we unite to advocate for the development of a parallel corridor that will bring states, cities, and its citizens new economic wealth and opportunities while creating safer and more efficient routes for all. We pursue the development of the corridor because improvements to infrastructure will unite the center of food, fiber, and fuel resources with industry and marketplace. Together, the corridor works to expand local economies as it serves eight of the top 10 wind generation states, 28% of the nation's ethanol refineries, five of the top six natural gas producing states, seven of the top 10 oil producing states, and four of the top eight farm states. Currently, an estimated $96 billion is exported between corridor states. But as we continue working toward this robust transportation system, the Freight Analysis Framework, FAF, projects an increase to $195 billion by 2040. On an international scale, the corridor fuels $280 billion in trade with Canada and Mexico, more than 25% of all U.S. trade with those countries. As a united front, we can affect policy, maintaining relationships with legislators on both sides of the aisle to ensure proper funding for expansion. We maintain this determination to build for tomorrow, but it requires an alliance committed to collaboration. Every member is vital to this effort. We're on the cusp of real change and a future for the corridor that will be transformative for our region and the country. Together, united, we are stronger. Thank you, Mayor, Council, uh, City Manager. Uh, my name is John Barrio, and I do serve on the City of San Angelo Development Corporation. By virtue of that, I'm an advisory member to the Ports of Plains Coalition. Our Mayor, Brenda Gunter, is the sitting member on that uh, coalition. Uh, in addition to what you just saw on the video, mention of the conference in Del Rio, uh, the possibility of a, another conference right here in San Angelo, uh, just this month, on January 7th and 8th, I had the, the privilege to be down in Austin at the Texas State Transportation uh, Forum, which is also a spinoff of everything else we have going on transportation-wise. Uh, I'd like to just give a brief rouster of the, the various speakers and those in attendance. We had Texas Department of Transportation folks, the Texas State Demographer, who spoke on population projections re relating to the future, particularly in the Permian Basin uh, San Angelo area. Uh, Texas former Secretary of State, Texas Comptroller, he talked on funding. Texas uh, Transportation Commissioners, including our own uh, former Mayor Alvin New. Uh, former Infrastructure Advisor to President Trump, a man by the name of Mr. D.J. Gribben. Uh, Mr. Gribben has been an advisor in the White House on infrastructure. He's currently stepped back into uh, private sector simply because the Congress has moved away from infrastructure for the time being. He's more effective being in touch with the, the industry. But as soon as the infrastructure issue comes back, he will be back in the White House. Uh, Texas Transportation uh, Institute was there. The, the list goes on and on. Probably the, the other most notable that I should mention is the former director of the National Security Agency, General Keith Alexander. Uh, many of the students here at Goodfellow have served under his uh, command and instruction as part of the National Security Agency. After 9-11, he in particular was tapped to stand up the Cybersecurity Command. 
which generated far more training at Goodfellow. He is a friend of San Angelo. But that being said, I attended every session that was there, but more importantly, was able to get personal time with several of these speaker, speakers. Pardon me. Uh, of specific interest for my attendance there was, of course, I-27 in Ports to Plains. But because I represent San Angelo as a whole, I-14 was also a, a key topic. Many of the presenters gave reports on the current status of projects, uh, deteriorating road conditions, legislative climate and funding mechanisms, and in the inherent funding challenges. Tommy Hebert's been often quoted as saying we need to do things at the speed of business, not the speed of government. Those funding challenges dictate the speed of government. Uh, it certainly highlighted the spectrum of needs and each demanding their own funding. And uh, it's not going to happen without that funding. But because of the one-on-one -on -one visits, I talked personally with DJ Gribben, who by coincidence I met as I was checking in and rode up on the elevator to my room with him and his wife. I didn't know he was a presenter. I didn't know his credentials. I simply knew by the lanyard hanging around his neck like mine, he was attending the conference as well. So I, I think that was a fate thing. We were put in touch with each other. Later, after he talked, uh, I had a chance to step up to him and reintroduce myself. He recognized me, and we had a very nice, lengthy conversation. Remember, he write you a check at that point? <laughs> he did almost as well, Miss Miss okay. Mayor. Uh, I told him the, the reason I was there and gave him my, sh my short spiel on I-27. And his comment to me was, it's already on the president's radar. What they're realizing is that, uh, that we now know the oil and gas uh, that's been found uh, in the Permian Basin rivals that of what's in all of the Middle East and what's in all of Russia. We have moved from the third largest oil producer in the world to the first. Oil and gas, petroleum in general, is the lifeblood of the world economy, not just our local economy. It's literally the heart. And they are realizing that without proper arteries to that heart, pipelines and roads, what's the good of us having all that resource without being able to connect with it? Uh, I have far more notes. I, I could go over a lot more things, but I, I want to bring this and, and keep it brief. General Alexander gave an example of this, the rapid rate that things are changing. He is basically a computer nerd by hobby. He said he still has a 56K modem like we all used to connect to AOL with. For a basis of comparison, current data rates are transferring in five seconds what his 56K modem would take 13 years to transmit. That's key because everything in our economy is moving that fast. While we have been working on the Ports to Plains uh, Coalition, from the ground up, the local communities lobbying to get this done, we've not really noticed that from the infrastructure standpoint of this nation, there are others who have been working their way down. And DJ Gribben summarized everything and said, it could be with the simple stroke of a pen that these projects are approved overnight. And uh, his closing question to me was, are your leaders prepared and equipped to be called to Washington on short notice to present your readiness to the president and his administration? I think that's the gist of my trip to Austin. Uh, the future is now, and it, it could very well happen overnight. Are we ready for it? it would, it's a privilege to serve the community, and it, it's absolutely spectacular to me to see this kind of progress for us. Thank you. Guy? Thank you, John. I, I don't have any further comments. I think John very eloquently uh, covered that, but Mayor would welcome any comments sure. that you might I'd, have. I'd like to offer some comments. Uh, without a doubt, when we talk about economic development, you cannot have a conversation about economic development without having a conversation about transportation. They are hand in hand. And 
We have from the past two legislative sessions that the Chamber of Commerce put on, we have talked aggressively about the food, fiber, fuel part of what happens in West Texas. And the only way that we can, as a nation, take advantage of the food, fiber, and fuel is to make sure that we have the quickest, most efficient, cost-effective way to get product to market. We know, for example, that in the original days, you know, today there's always a lot of conversation about West Texas doesn't have the population that I-35 has, but I want to remind everybody that when the original transportation interstate conversation happened, population was never a part of where those roads went. It was about finding the most efficient way to move people and then military equipment from east to west or north to south. Population was not the conversation. So we in West Texas should not be discouraged because of the population growth on I-35 in terms of the importance of what we have happening here with the potential of the I-14 expansion as well as I-27. We also realize the fact that a lot of the funding that will come forward for 27 or 14 will be tax dot funding. And tax dot plays a very, very important role in terms of our ability to get the four lane interstate quality highways. And because of that, we have reorganized the I-27 Ports to Plains organization where we no longer have an executive director, but we have a second lobbyist that we've hired, Kent Hans Scarborough's group, to represent us in Austin. Because prior to this, we only had a lobbying group in Washington, D.C. who had no connections to the Austin market whatsoever. So we've reorganized the organization to find the funds to support strong legislative representation in Austin. And we will be going to Austin on March 7th, 6th and 7th. Um, we will spend two days working with our legislators then and come up with hopefully a strong coalition and support uh, with Alvin New supporting us and making sure that everyone hears what West Texas and the I-27, I-14 corridors mean to all of us and to the country. We might not be the population, but the population survives off of the products that come out of West Texas. And the nation survives, internationally survives off of the products that come out of West Texas. My comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to add just one thing that I had edited out of my notes as I read them. Uh, but it does, uh, it's a great segue, Brenda, thank you. Uh, the state demographer uh, had wonderful slides. I wish I could have gotten them from him. Uh, but when I-69 was completed down in South Texas, it spawned 25% growth in the existing cities and uh, what he referred to as radical growth in the unincorporated extraterritorial extra jurisdictions between them. Just imagine what that will do to the San Angelo area. 25% growth practically overnight, or at least in about a 10-year period. Not, not overnight, but <laughs> man, as we call it, manageable growth. Yes, uh, but our future is tremendously bright. Thank, Thank you. you. We will now move on. Yeah, I've been asked to have a five-minute break, so five minutes it is. It is now, um, let's see, it's 10.33. We will be back at 1045. Start off with our new introduction and a welcoming our new airport manager. Mayor, uh, we do want to welcome Jeremy Valgardson. Um, he comes to us from Cedar City, Utah. Um, he, uh, I had the, the pleasure at, at being in the uh, interview committee that interviewed him as well. Interviewed very well. We called uh, his, uh, the pe people he had listed. I think everyone just uh, spoke very, very highly of him. We're very blessed to have him on board with us, Mayor. So. Again, Jeremy, do you have anything you'd like to share with the city council members? Um, yep, I'll keep it brief because I know you're busy today. Um, like you said, my name is Jeremy Valgartson. Um, excited for this opportunity to meet with you and to, to be a part of your organization. Uh, real quick about me, I started in aviation as a pilot. I got my commercial pilot certificate. Um, graduated in 08 when the airlines were kind of tanking, and so I went this different direction and got into airport management. 
Uh, I've worked at the Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport, the third busiest general aviation airport in the nation at uh, Mesa Falcon Field Airport, where I really learned operations and maintenance. Moved into the commercial world at the Provo Airport back in Utah. Um, and then for the last four years, I've been at the Cedar City Airport um, as the airport manager at a commercial service airport. So one thing that I did that I finished at Cedar City is we finished our master plan project. Um, so I'm excited to jump into this plan. Um, in Cedar, we were very successful. We got $40 million, um, 20 awarded for a runway project that we're doing and another 20 on the books for runways and taxiways. And the only way we got it is through the justification in the master plan. So I'm excited to be here and, and thank you for this That's opportunity. Fabulous. We're, we're, you, yeah, we're, we're glad to have you here. We did hire him with the understanding that he needs to get us a $40 million grant as well. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, uh, I wondered if some no of that was No pressure, pressure Jeremy. Yeah, I was hoping condition. some of that would be <laughs> transferable, was it not? <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a condition of employment, it no? Maybe. It may be. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here and we're glad the timing is right because we have approved to have a master plan done. Um, Council truly supports the growth and development of our airport. We realize our airport is one of the greatest assets we have here in San Angelo, and we need to make sure that we invest back into it so that um, as we look forward to the future that there's a plan to ensure that we will always have an airport here in San Angelo full of activity, business development, business parks, new hangars. I could go on for a laundry list, but I'm going to wait for the Molly to present her laundry list, and then we'll comment on that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Oh, Mitch, I'm sorry. I well, passed it off to Molly, that's, but that's I should have passed it to you. <laughs> that's Thank all you. I'm going to do. I'm going to pass it off to Molly. Uh, Molly will give you the presentation on the master plan thus far. Has been approved since August 7th. Uh, moving forward, we've finished our inventory phase. We're working on our forecasting phase right now. Um, established some advisory committees and hosted meetings with those committees thus far. But at this time, I'd like to invite Ms. Molly Waller up from Centurion Planning and Design. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Good happy morning. to be here. It's, it's a transportation at the end of your city council meeting. Um, I always have to remember the down arrow. Excellent. I'm going to give you just a really quick update on the airport master plan. I know that people are wondering what we've been doing since August 8th, so we'll fill that in. And again, what is an airport master plan? So happy to hear the airport director just finished. Um, we now know $40 million is our goal on our CIP. Um, but again, it's a process to plan for the short, intermediate, and long-term facility needs of the airport. So we're looking at runways, taxiways, hangars, those types of things. What are you going to need to meet your demand, as well as commercial service within plane months? Um, we're preparing in accordance with the FA guidance materials and industry standards. And at the end of the process, we're going to have a phase development plan, that capital improvement plan that's going to outline what the airport needs moving forward. And then the best of the project is we're going to figure out who else can pay for it other than the city of San Angelo. As far as project schedule goes, we have been essentially building the framework for this study. We've completed the project inventory, which includes um, aerial photography, some imagery. Um, we are in the final stages of the aviation forecast. And we had another firm that helped us with that that are experts. Um, we're gonna go over that today with the, with the director and the assistant director of the airport. Um, final stages of the aviation forecast. And then we also have our team working on the demand capacity. And then we're gonna start the fun part, which is the alternatives. We have had a, a series of meetings. We had our project kickoff meeting where we brought our whole team in. Centurion, we have just a part of this. We brought in some great resources. So we had our whole team come in for that project kickoff meeting um, with the airport leadership. Uh, Mr. Dane was there. We then moved in on a November 8th. We had a series of meetings with our planning and our technical advisory committee. And just to refresh you, we have two committees for this project, which is a little not traditional for an airport the size of St. Angelo. The planning advisory committee is kind of the big picture. It's the economic development picture. It's the, the vision of the airport from how it's going to grow up. The technical advisory committee is more users. It's what are the folks that are the airport need. Met with both of those, had a very robust discussion with strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So got a lot of really great input um, and met some great people through those meetings. Uh, we what also was some a, of the comments? Um, some of the comments. You guys have great fixed-based operators. Um, so credit to that. Access to the airport was brought up as a weakness. If, you know, the bridge goes out at Knickerbocker, how do folks get to the airport? 
Um, so that was something that you know we hadn't really thought about. Um, so that was something that was great benefit. Commercial service came up on a number of occasions. Fares are going up at your airport, and so a lot of the things that you know we've been seeing as a frequent traveler into San Angelo, I'm reiterating what we're seeing in the city is aware of it. Um, one of the things that came out of the planning advisory committee meetings that we felt was very relevant was all of the outside forces that have an impact on that airport and the opportunities that are provided by that. Whether it's education, um, it was brought up that Goodfellow Air Force Base has what uh, my business partner <laughs> termed a booster club and folks that are out there constantly looking at what's going to impact possibly Goodfellow. Maybe the airport needs something like that. So that's kind of where the conversations went. Um, hopefully the, the conversations continued after the meetings, but those were some of the things that resonate the most. From a facility standpoint, the city does a great job maintaining your facility. Um, so there was, there was a lot of kudos given to the airport for how it's managed, how it's run, and how it's maintained. Uh, we did have a public workshop and a meeting, and it's, it's, it wasn't as well attended as we would like for it to be attended. Five, ten years ago, you would fill the room with those types of meetings. Now it seems people get a lot of their information on the Internet, whether it's social media, whether it's the news. So we did have a discussion regarding our future public workshop and if maybe we need to work with the city's PIO to do a Facebook Live instead of a come to the airport. That way if a mom's sitting at soccer practice, she can you know listen in um, while she's waiting for her kiddo to get done or something along those lines. So that was some outcome from the public workshop. Um, next step is completing the aviation forecast with the oil and gas development picking back up. We've got some great numbers that we're looking at. We've got some great comparables. Again, we're going to get the demand capacity analysis and identify what facilities are needed, whether it's taxiway, hotel, or our other facilities at the airport, and then go to the fun part, which is the alternatives. We expect to have our next round of planning and technical advisory committee meetings in April. Um, that gives us enough time to come to the committees with some good, valid information to facilitate discussions. So that's where we are now. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, obviously, when we do a master plan, the time frame that it takes from beginning to end is a long time frame. In the process of developing this plan, what I would like to hope that we could accomplish are some things that would have a more immediate impact, things that could be done um, that would help improve that airport on a shorter term, like additional hangars, which we know are very much needed. But also, there's items that are outside the fence line versus inside the fence line. And assuming that um, some of those might have the ability to be um, attacked quicker, sooner, faster than what might happen within the fence line. So I want to make sure that time-wise we have the mentality that this could happen here and this is longer term down here. So we start to see something developing because I think we're behind the eight ball in terms of getting this master plan developed and done. Um, it's something the city needs very much so. And so uh, I want to make sure that we're looking at it from that perspective. Why do, if we need more hangar space and more hangar space is obviously needed outside perhaps the fence line, what's the time frame that something like that could happen? Most definitely. And I, and I will say, um, the alternatives analysis is when a really a lot of those things get on paper. And so I think after this next round of meetings, it's my hopes there's something. One thing I'll mention, the City Council did approve a land use management study, which is happening parallel to the airport master plan. And that's focused more, like you said, on the business park. And we do expect deliverables from that study to occur ahead of the master plan just because of the process. You have to follow for master plan approvals. Um, I want to hear, we need that business yes, part well, to happen. We're gearing up. February is going to be a big month for that study. We're okay. getting meetings set up even this week, and so February will be the month that we really start moving on that study. Okay. Do I have any questions? Comp Billy? I just have one question. Um, on the project schedule where it has airport layout plan, can you speak a little more to what that entails? Yes. Um, we, what, what happens is, is we you have an air. I'm going to summarize this as quick as I can, and hopefully it makes sense. Um, an airport layout plan set is something that's required by the FAA, and it's the big engineering drawings, 24 by 36. And essentially, it shows your existing facilities and your planned facilities in the future. 
So we're currently in the process of putting together all the existing facilities on the exhibit. Once we go through the alternatives process and a recommended development concept is selected, we will then add the proposed development to the airport, and then that all goes to the FAA for all of the FAA reviews. So we can't complete that airport layout plan set until a recommended development concept is identified. So could it possibly mean, you know, our recent renovation and all was pretty costly. Might we be required to redesign the renovation that is not that old? No, you, um, the one thing I will say that last master plan at the St. Angelo Airport was done in, I believe, 1994. And so you didn't really have a, a current master plan. I will say that the city and airport leadership has done a very good job, even with your terminal building, not designing for what is currently there. So essentially, you've had some small planning efforts that have been occurring over the past five, 10 years. Um, and so what we're finding is everything that's been done is a prohibiting the future. So we're not seeing a lot of teardown renovations. There are some older facilities that we're looking at, um, but as far as like the money that was spent on that commercial service terminal, it was planned for the future. A lot of that money came from the FFA. It, did. it didn't yes. come from local tax. Yep. yep. Lane, do you have a question or comment? Um, I, I, I have, Molly, the mayor referenced things outside the fence line. Um, if I heard you correctly, part of your analysis, analysis and uh, what you'll be looking at is infrastructure. Is that both inside the fence and outside the fence as well? Yes, it so, is. Uh, you know, the, I would say the city, I know I have an interest in that because of some just some things that um, need to be taken care of from, from uh, outside the fence line in that area of town, maybe not specifically on the airport, but any impacts of that. So I'm, I, I, I don't wanna make an assumption, so let me ask the question directly. Are you, are you in communication with our water utilities folks? Yes, okay, good. we actually um, got a little head start on that LUM study that I mentioned. We brought a group in and they did an evaluation of the, and the, not the water and wastewater facilities that are not currently being used. Um, and meetings were had with Allison and the folks downtown regarding those findings and everything that we found, they're then pulling into the city study. Okay, good, yes. That, that, that was my question, Mayor. Harry, Thanks. Any questions, comments? Yeah, I'd like to see the, the final when we get through that here, but I think we're moving in the right direction. All right, there's no vote or motion required on this, so Molly, thank you very much. Tina, you're up next on the update on the sales tax revenue performance. Good morning, Mayor, Council, Mr. Valenzuela. I have for you your update on the quarterly, you asked for a quarterly report for the first quarter of the fiscal year. And so for that first quarter, um, sales tax was up 12.25% in the first quarter compared with the same quarter in the prior year. Um, and we were over budget for revenue for that same quarter by $474,000. And then this would be your sales tax by industry for, this, for that same quarter. And for the month of January, sales tax was up 4.95% compared with the same month in the prior year. And that's basically November. Sales for November, yes ma'am, yes ma'am. Um, and we were over budget for our revenue by $585,000 year to date. Certainly the 4.95% is, is small compared to the large percent we had the prior month. Yes. So we still wanna maintain a conservative approach and not uh, believe that one month's performance is a year's performance and make sure we're controlling our expenses relative to that. Certainly there's some flow over from one month to the next, which might inflate one month as it probably did. Right. Was it 22%? But I think the plan that the um, council approved is a conservative plan and one that keeps us um, on budget and was perhaps some opportunity, but we still must be conservative. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. We are going to move into the closed session, the executive session on the provision of government code, Title V, Open Government Ethics, Subtitle A, Open Government, Chapter 551, 
open meetings, subchapter D, exceptions to requirement that meetings be open under the following sections. A, section 551.071, one, A, consult with attorney when the governmental body seeks the advice of its attorney about pending or contemplated litigation regarding Sheila Andrews versus the city of San Angelo. Item B, section 551.0712, consult with attorney when the governmental body seeks the advice of its attorney on a matter in which the duty of the attorney to the governmental body under the De Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct of the State Bar of Texas clearly conflicts with this chapter regarding municipal court contract negotiations. And C, section 551.074A1, to deliberate the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee regarding board commissions or appointments. With that, we will adjourn, and I believe we'll be out 45 minutes. Seven on um, January the 22nd, we will call the meeting back to order. Item nine is follow-up and administrative issues. A is consider items discussed in executive session. There's nothing to present or to offer up for um, any information. So we will go on to item B, consider approving various board nominations. Park Commissioner Don Griffiths at large to fourth term ending January 2023. Bitsy Stone at large to third term ending January 2023. And Allison Watkins at large to first full term ending January 2023. Do I have a a motion to approve item 9B. So move. Second. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Any public comment? With no public comment, we'll take a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 None opposed. Motion passes 4-0. I mean 5-0, sorry. We'll go on to item C, discussion of the May 2019 City Council schedule regarding um, election canvassing. Uh, Julia, do you have something on that? Yes, um, we typically meet obviously the first and third Tuesdays of the month and um, with the election results coming in, we'll need to canvas on the 14th or the 15th. If we find ourselves in a situation where we've got to do a runoff, the only day that would work for us is May 15th. So I just wanted to see if we want to go ahead and schedule that for a Wednesday to be um, ahead of ourselves or if we want to wait and kind of see how um, the rest of the application period comes in. Well, it wouldn't change our city council meetings. So the city council meetings are on the 7th and the 21st, right? But we've got to canvas either the 14th or the 15th. Let's and wait and see because, um, you know, three, we keep, keep changing the city council meetings, right? So this would be the third time in spring season we've changed city council meetings so unless there's a have to do it today do we okay, have time we to make wait. that decision yeah. see what happens okay <clears throat> all right so then if we move into um item d are there any announcements or consideration for future agenda i'd yes, like Billy. um to put on a future agenda item, an update on our street project list, just to see where we are and um, the time frame, things like that. Any other items? I don't have any items for the agenda, but I have an announcement. I don't know how many people know this, but I heard over the weekend that Angelo State Livestock Judging Team was voted the number one in the nation over A&M and Texas Tech and UT, yeah. So congratulations. Do I have a motion for adjournment? So move. move. Second. Any opposed? A vote of five to zero, I'm assuming. Aye. Motion is meeting as adjourned.